So today I will talk about the uh, retrotransposon variation in human genome and tumor uh, genesis. Uh, I will talk about the basically the old uh, Minion project we had uh, a few years back. So uh, a bit ba uh, background on retrotransposons. So uh, they are these uh, copy-paste elements in the genome that uh, uh, basically copy themselves through uh, RNA intermediate. So uh, you have these full-length uh, uh, transposable elements in the genome, six, uh, six KB for line one elements, and uh, it's copied to RNA by regular transcription and then insert it uh, somewhere else and reverse transcribe. Often the reverse transcription is not very complete, so it ends uh, soon, typically a few hundred bases. Uh, the 6KB line one elements are the kind of the auton autonomous uh, retrotransposon, so it contains two proteins that uh, or open reading frames that then code proteins that uh, are responsible for the reverse transcription and the uh, nicking the DNA. Uh, yeah, and the reverse transcription often fails, so the insertions are typically not uh, full length. Uh, the alus are even more common than line ones. They are 300 uh, base pair elements but uh, they are not as interesting for me because they are more active in the germline, whereas line ones are sometimes activated in the tumors. Uh, and for some reason, somatically also in the brain or neurons. Uh, yeah. Uh, the difficulty with short reads with uh, and L, uh, line ones or transposable elements overall is that uh, there are a lot of retrotransposons and they are very repetitive. So there's some estimate that 50% of human genome is derived from transposons. Uh, that's kind of fishy estimate because many of the transos uh, transposons are highly mutated, so you can still map it. But there are still uh, hundreds or thousands of perfect copy, almost perfect copy in of uh, uh, line ones, thousands definitely for ALUs, and those are very difficult to map. And uh, they are very easy to, uh, this transposon, uh, uh, this copy events are very easy to uh, mistake for translocations. For example, this uh, Nature Genetics uh, paper from TCGA a few years back said that this CTC28 gene uh, is often uh, disrupted by translocation, balance, uh, well, a translocation in the colorectal tumors. And that sounds fishy because it would be much easier to delete the gene or put a point mutation, and there's no such signal in TTC28. And when you look closely, there is actually a very active line one element in, was it the first intron of TTC28? And uh, this particular line one has a, a feature that it has a sloppy polyadenylation signal in the end, also basically the end of transcription signal. So every now and well, to our understanding, often the transcription goes past the end of the line one, and it copies the unique sequence downstream from the repetitive line one, and that will provide the kind of mapping information to uh, that looks like translocation, and. Uh, we want to use long nanopore reads to do mapping uh, of these uh, elements. And uh, this is actually from our Illumina genomes. This TTC28 element is mapped, 
tran uh, transposed to all of these places in, I think, in 200 genomes done on Illumina. But we don't know what, what the uh, sequence, con how much of the L1 has been copied or uh, what kind of process has there been. There's uh, different ways to incorporate the L1. And of course, the mean ion was coming at the time and we wanted to play around with it. So uh, this is what we ca uh, came up. So uh, we wanted to map the transductions from that one particular hot L1 element, the one in TCC28. Uh, and the uh, question is, how do we target the sequencing? With our first minion run probably produced 100 megabases of reads, so that, uh, that wasn't that successful. But uh, <coughs> so the targeting method we uh, came up was this uh, old-fashioned inverse PCR. So uh, basically what you do is you digest the genome with a restriction enzyme. It will cut uh, outside of the region that you, uh, you're interested in. Uh, and uh, so basically here is the line one and here is the unique sequence that is uh, often transduced. Uh, and it's inserted to some other place. So the restriction enzymes cut the genome to pieces and then you uh, let it sur uh, circularize and you ligate it to this kind of uh, circle, DNA circles, and have a PCR primers designed on this unique sequence to the inverse direction so you can amplify the circular template. And uh, when you do the nanopore sequencing, you get these, uh, well, basically two kinds of reads. This native locus with uh, read starting here and flipping at the restriction and some restriction site to the other end of the fragment and ending in the other second primer. And in the target regions, you get this uh, this some unknown region that is sufficient to map to the genome that you know where the where the insertion was. And you also get this inserted sequence in between. Only thing you miss is the bit of sequence between these uh, uh, primers. Uh, now I was just thinking that uh, you can probably do this nowadays with the Cas9 protocol. So if you put the pri uh, Cas9 targeting here, you'll get uh, that region is here, so you get reads here and here, so you get almost the same information with that. Uh, what you don't get is the information that these uh, these fragments are in the same loca uh, same molecule. I don't know if that's important. Also, with Cas9 targeting, you would get the methylation. Uh, if that's important. Uh, good thing about this is that uh, uh, when you have enough starting material and your PCR is successful and your sequencing is succe successful, our second run produced maybe a gig or two gig gigabases of sequence and that produced thou thousands of uh, reads for each insertion. So the good thing is that we had very good sensitivity. There was uh, these lots of novel, highly subclonal insertions, basically 1% uh, clonality or half a percent. And that you can't uh, detect with uh, whole genome VG, uh, Illumina VGS. There was actually one insertion that had one read pair supporting it in uh, Illumina. Yeah, uh, and that's for targeting stuff. 
Uh, what we're really interested in is the whole genome sequencing. So we bought the uh, promethion in the early access and waited a long time. And uh, we've run a few flow cells. And there are interesting results. For example, the L1s, the line one elements are fairly easy to detect. Uh, Sniffles will do that. For he here is a one colorectal cancer tumor. Uh, Sniffles has called a line one insertion here, or long insertion, and it gives the sequence, and you can map it to repeat mask and so on. So it's a line one. And here are the reads. Uh, you can see that these kind of the insertion sequences are mapped to two different locations. And that's actually the line one biology, that the insertion has duplicated this small segment between here, and it's on both sides of the insertion. So this uh, feed alignment is not, uh, not wrong. This is correctly, but uh, it does make the variant calling a bit, bit more difficult. And you can uh, kind of play around with this data. For example, you can, instead of mapping the reads to the genome, you can map genome to the reads. So here's one read, one, uh, one and a half kilobase read, and mapping the genome to the read. Here's a uh, segment of chromosome 10. Here's another segment of chromosome 10, and there's a small overlap between them. And here you have the inserted sequence in reverse strand copied from the chromosome 22 where the TTC28 is. So uh, this is kind of uh, one way of looking at this data. Uh, ALUS, this is ALU deletion, easy. This is only 5x genome, whole genome, which is uh, not very successful run with uh, promethion. But anyway, you can even phase these. This, uh, these reads have been phased with uh, known vari uh, SNP variants. And you can see that the ALU is in this chromosome. And, uh, with the Illumina data, you can maybe say that there is missing ALU, but not very clear. Uh, so nowadays, we're currently running a big, uh, big project on uh, promethion. Uh, I was hoping to show you this, uh, this uh, retrotransposone data for these uh, early samples. We're, we've so far sequenced few dozen uterine lyomyomas and matching normals, uh, protocol being uh, aligning with Minimap2 and call SV sn with sniffles. Uh, the technicality is that you need few reads, uh, at least three reads, I would say, to call variants, because the, there's a risk of ligation artifacts in the library prep. And sometimes you get this uh, 2D squared kind of read, but you get this also the other strand of the same read sequence. Uh, and that, that needs kind of filtering or something. And the uh, transposable element re recognition is easy, it's just mapping the inserted or deleted uh, sequence to repeat mask database. Uh, I made a table, but these numbers are too high, or at least wrong somehow. Uh, uh, so the story of the whole genome analysis is basically that the Sniffles is best caller that I know of. Uh, it's not perfect. There are issues. Uh, the important things that need to be done is population calling or genotyping methods. So basically when you know a variant, you want to know wh whether your sample has it. Uh, that is the same thing, kind of, that same thing can be used for somatic calling, and that, that's missing right now. Uh, whether the simple mini-mapping to repeat mask is enough for transposable elements, that's a question. 
uh, and even with long reads, small repeats on the breakpoints causes problems. And thanks to uh, people, Professor Lauri Aaltonen is the person who gets the money, so <laughs> this is all his data. Uh, and uh, he gets the money from these people, and Center for Scientific Computing provides the disk space for storing all the fast queues. So they kind of given 600 terabases of disk space. Thank you.